once again today thanking you for another opportunity to live and to serve in Ashland, Kentucky. We ask today for your wisdom and guidance on this Board of Mayor and Commissioners as we strive to make the right decisions for our city and its people. <coughs> Bless our city manager, our staff and employees, and most of all our citizens. Bless all those in attendance today and be with us throughout this afternoon. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All favor? Aye. Uh, Those received by the minutes of our regular meeting January 10th, 2019, and our regular meeting January 24th, 2019. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Hearing reports. Commissioners, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Welcome you this afternoon. So we got a full house, and I've got Tomcat football schedules in my pocket if anybody needs one. Okay? <laughs> a lot of Tomcat here. Tomcat people here today. I'm glad to see you all at this youth leadership. My daughter was in this a couple years ago, and it's a good thing. I just want to say uh, welcome and thanks. many thanks to Ashland in Motion and the sponsors and all the vendors for last Saturday at the Gravy Bowl. It was an overflow crowd, <laughs> uh, to say the least. And it was a good day. It was the second annual year that this has taken place, and it was a real successful event. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm just going to add to that just a little bit. Um, again, the Ashland Youth Leadership Group, uh, Commissioner Bell, 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 Commissioner
out of Middletown and elsewhere to uh, market that property. I think uh, the day of thinking that they're going to come in and, and maybe start working again there, I think they've been hanging about thread for several years. I, when I graduated from college, my first summer job out of college was at Armco Steel, and there were about 57, 5,800 employees there. My dad worked there and raised us. Most of the kids in Ashland were Armco families. Uh, Ashland had a lot of impact too, but, but the biggest impact was, was Armco. It, it began, of the, uh, began as a Ashland coal and manufacturing, iron coal and manufacturing company back before the turn of the century. And uh, a little, little bit of history. Uh, I used to study Central Park in depth. Central Park used to be privately owned by Armco. And they used to have huge uh, fairs and festivals there every year. And there was actually, at a time, <coughs> there was a wooden fence that went all the way around Central Park. There was also a racetrack in Central Park, up where the CP number one diamond is, was a racetrack. And you, if you go to the library or some places around town have pictures uh, of actually the racetrack, the grandstand, and one of the big tall birch trees or beech trees there, they actually cut a hole in the roof of the grandstand and had this huge uh, beech tree that went up through it. Uh, a lot of a lot of history there. Well, uh, Armco was in a lurch one year, one time of the year to meet payroll. So they contacted the, the mayor and commission here in Ashland and offered to sell the city <coughs> park uh, for $32,500. That was in 1900. $32,500. There's 47 acres up there. And, you know how valuable it would be if you were going to build developments there or to a business or anything. But fortunately, uh, Armco needed the money, and the other fortunate thing was that our city had the foresight. Now, they gave the city five years to pay that chunk, the 32 pounds. So they did it in payments yeah. over a five year period. So we have, for the size of our town, there's no city in America that has a park on its central park. And we protect it all we can every day and uh, it's, it belongs to everybody in Ashland. It's part of their yard and that's the way I look at it. But, but anyway, uh, that's, a, that's a little history I like to throw out. Since we've got students here, you can take that with you. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of old timers in Ashland have no clue. Arm code sold that to, some, uh, to the city or for, for how much. But, there are so many wonderful pictures of the history of Ashland at the library, big books that you can look back through. And it makes you proud, <coughs> it makes you very proud of, of being an Ashland or a Greena County. We used to be one county, Greena. You all know that? Uh, so we were all one big county. And uh, we have too many counties in Kentucky. If you remember Kentucky history, we have 120. And you know, you take some states, like Florida has 22. <coughs> And they have 10 times the number or more than that. So, you know, Ohio has 88. I went to college in Ohio, taught Ohio history, believe it or not, but I, I remember everything about Ohio. But big cities, a lot of population, they have 80. We have 120 counties. We should not have that. If, if, you're ever, if you're ever in the legislature, enough of you, <coughs> I talk to them all the time. And it'll never happen, of course. We don't need that many. That means 120 county judges. Jailers, sheriffs, police patrols in the county, city, duplication of services that your parents, your grandparents, ours, everybody pays for all those extra services. We should have fewer counties, fewer governments. It would make everything better for everyone. I assure you it would. But anyway, that being said, we're glad you're here. Glad you take something with you uh, from here that maybe makes you proud of your city government. Okay. Well, man, I'd like to say one thing. Go right ahead. We, we, there, something historic happened, and I, I, I just found it out. The first time in history that the Ashland American and Ashland National Little League have merged, and now it's going to be the Ashland League. 
And so that's that's the story. They merged. Well, that that is good, and it's not so good. <laughs> Let me tell you why it's not so good. I've got to tell you this. I pitched the first game in Ashland Woolley history. Ed Virginis, who just went out of office with Judge Toller, was a deputy judge. He pitched with the Cubs, I pitched with the Reds. The first game back in 1955. I know I don't look that old, but I am. And Commissioner Goop, that's, that's a good thing to bring up. But what it tells me is, number one thing to tell me, we don't have enough kids to play Little League. We had <coughs> we started there were kids everywhere. Sure. There were only there were four teams in the national four in America. Sure. So there were only eight then. But then the, the two the, the next year Babe Ruth started, I got to play the first Babe Ruth game. I wasn't a pitcher then, but I played. But the kids played. Now there's a combination of we don't have as many families, as many kids, because the only way you have them is jobs. As a case closed. I got out of college, started coaching and teaching at Public Junior High. We had 900, well, we had about 800 students. Coles Junior High, the only next had 900 students. 1,700 students in, in junior high. And I wasn't, I was in administration when they combined the schools, which was kind of a sad thing, because it meant your population was dwindling. That happens all over America. Cities, downtowns, everything. We have to think, <coughs> that we're great survivors. Armco dipping down to where they you know, became AK and now they're closed. Ashnall was a Fortune 500 company. We had the executive headquarters that started here. And of course, the majority of the employees work at the plant. It was Ashnall, now it's Marathon. It's still vitally important to us. But about 400, administrative jobs in the, <coughs> the old national building under empty uh, it hurt everybody in town when they left and you understand jobs means the businesses that you have in your community have people to shop there to use their services to buy their materials whatever the case might be schools depend on jobs <coughs> in the community and we're doing everything we can to bring jobs back into Ashland because everything depends on it. So I want you to know we're, we're, we're after it. And you all uh, will either reap the benefits or maybe it won't get as good as we hope it gets, but we think we're on an upswing. And with things that hit us, you imagine a steel plant that used to have almost 6,000 people and it got down to when they closed the other day, it's about 230 and they closed. And National took all the executives and, a lot. and many of those people were volunteers, donators to charities. I mean, there's so many appendages out there when you have people with good jobs in your community. They help others. They help with everything. When I have a collective audience of young people, I like to say some of these things because it's on your shoulders. <coughs> and we're still fighting the battles, but it will be on your shoulders. We're glad you're here. City Manager? Uh, three items, Mayor. If I could have Candy McKinney come up, please. Tammy is one of our uh, valued city employees who works uh, down at the bus station, and she went above and beyond the call of duty a couple of days ago. I'm going to read a little bit of details uh, that are uh, associated with the Certificate of Achievement. On <coughs> January 30th, we had a Greyhound bus that should have arrived at 5.20 in the morning and didn't pull in until 2.30 in the afternoon. When the Greyhound bus pulled into our lane between the building and the flood wall, it broke down. There were 15 passengers on board, one being the toddler and the driver. They were hours delayed on their trip and were pretty miserable. Uh, Tammy, through her swift and thoughtful work, listened to their frustrations, some of which were hunger from being stuck on a bus way longer than anticipated. They were tired, miserable, and cold. Tammy made contact with the corporate office of Greyhound, continued pushing until she spoke with upper level, upper level management, quite like the Bulldog, I'm told, and relayed their complaints and concerns, especially about being hungry. Uh, since we only have the vending machine on site, Greyhound agreed <coughs> to uh, offer to buy them pizza while they're waiting for another bus. Tammy got contact information for Almas and did Almas and did the legwork for getting them pizza and then she served them, uh, made them a pot of coffee uh, and coordinated with the maintenance staff to put cones out and block the lane until 
uh, make sure others were aware of the bus. So these weren't even technically <coughs> our city customers, if you will. But Tammy saw a need, she jumped to it, she didn't have to be told, and this is just a great reflection of what this city staff does, not just for our citizens, for making an impact on those people, Mayor, who do come through the city and say, those people will never forget Ashland, Tammy, because of you. That's got a special place in their heart, and we want to publicly recognize you. Right. And again, people like Tammy, it's like, y'all talk about the park, because it's the, the jewel of our town. It's really our people who make it, our employees make our city, our city government. You know, not the elected officials and those people just with some strangers not even from here just stopping by they'll never forget national Kentucky because of you Tim. now my secretary does these and she makes the print a little bigger <laughs> these are prescription by the way I have 33 pairs of these in every room in the house and all that anyway Tammy Kay, uh, February 13, 2019. You're being committed for swift and thoughtful work on taking care of stranded Greyhound bus passengers on January 30th, 2019. Thank you for being a compassionate and going above and beyond to care for those in an extremely adverse situation. In recognition of your excellent performance and dedication to serving the citizens, community of Ashton, Kentucky, we say thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. The second item I had, Mayor, Commissioners, and uh, City was uh, we did get to attend the KLC, the Kentucky League of Cities Board of Directors meeting yesterday. Actually, I got to attend that. Had two speakers, Representative uh, Bam Carney, who's the House Majority Floor Leader, and also Robert Stiver, who's the current Senate President. As you can imagine, the number one topic was on the pages. Uh, and just for you to know, KLC, the Kentucky League of Cities, is advocating that um, the county and uh, employees' retirement system. Uh, be separated from Kentucky retirement system. And the reason they're advocating for that is that the county and city employees pay about 70% into that fund and they're about 30% represented on the board. It's a very controversial topic. Um, as you can imagine, we did hear those representatives talk about the complexity and that it's the number one thing and they have to deal with it because of the impact of many of the people that are sitting in the back of the room, especially, uh, but across the state. Of course, you can see <coughs> on, on the television about that. Uh, of no mayor, the, the Louisville mayor, uh, is definitely making a cry for all cities to continue to push with our elected officials at the state level on what the pain threshold is going to be uh, in the cities as this continue uh, bill uh, request or requires more money from the cities and ours is 12 percent potentially for 10 years if i understand the bill correctly the last thing i wanted to mention mayor was uh, recently there was discussion uh, recommendations from in one of these sessions about the city adopting a, a responsible bidder ordinance. Uh, the city staff has reviewed our existing procurement ordinance that we talked about a couple of meetings and in accordance with the ordinance have created a detailed two documents, a bidder vendor pre-qualification disclosure statement and a defined evaluated bid criteria. So essentially the bidder vendor pre-qualification disclosure statement determines if companies are qualified to bid or not on city projects. Um, we can disqualify bidders who have not performed a standard in the past, although that happens very rarely. Uh, this would enable us to do that pretty cleanly. Uh, also, the defined evaluated bid criteria provides the city with flexibility to not necessarily go with the lowest bid. It allows us to define and, and determine exactly the, or the specifications for lowest evaluated bid. So I wanted to let, and we'll start uh, implementing that um, soon, and I didn't know if y'all had any questions on that or, or not. So I appreciate all the staff's work on it. I think <coughs> uh, when we had uh, some local labor representatives come in, and they were concerned about um, training, uh, or more so the, the workman's comp, do they have workman's comp, do they, do they have uh, uh, OSHA, they pay, or they, they deal with OSHA standards and, and those issues like that. And in fact, our ordinance contained both of those items in particular. And in checking around the state and looking at our ordinance, we ours is very solid. Now. And I think what uh, everybody interested in that should know is that we've added in an evaluation process. We want to get very many bidders, plain and simple. <coughs> and um, so I got a list of, of the contractors and companies that have been bidding over the years or have picked up bid packets come and they pay, <coughs> pay money to get the packet 
they don't submit a bid or or whatever the case may be so I sent a letter of contact on them so I'm getting a few calls every day and uh, learning you know number one because they got my letter they're now interested in getting in the mix uh, we can't guarantee anybody you know who's going to get those bids but we want a good representation from our area now there are places like I talked to a couple for y'all's information over in Ohio a really nice people I talked to on the phone and just said that they uh, they don't have right to work in Ohio and there's a prevailing wage over there and, and they're not going to come over here and work their men won't work uh, over here because you know it's it's not regulated anymore so those were our hands we can't do anything about that but <coughs> and the other thing is of course our legal counsel had to hang tough with us on uh, the evaluation process of you know it's easy to say I mean we always uh, when I was in the school system and most of my life and then when I got the administration there we we always use the terminology lowest most responsible bidder and that kind of means somebody that really can do the job and will do the job uh, and I have found because I've been in city government a long time and I've been in the school system <coughs> almost 40 years that public agencies like a school system or like the city are not always treated the same way by contractors as if a company like King's Daughters Hospital or uh, Marathon Oil hires a contractor in. They, the contractor knows they better they better do the right thing. Well, we want them to think the same thing. We take a job in the city, and I hope in the school system the same way. We take a job in the superintendent. I'll tell you that. We we watched everything going on. If we if we weren't sure, we would hire a construction manager to oversee it, and it, it's it saves you money by spending a little bit more money to oversee a job. So it's kind of a I'm hoping that the publicity will, will be Carly things like. Uh, we expect, and I've met with a couple contractors over the last year or so with the city manager that we're having some difficulties with. And I make sure they understand real quick that when I sit down at the table, I have 22,000 taxpaying citizens looking over my shoulder, saying, Mayor, you gotta get the best job possible for us. That's our hard earned tax money. And you know in Ashland, Kentucky, and a lot of other small town Americans, the majority of our people are not working. The majority of our people are uh, over 55, and many of them have paid their dues. <coughs> many of them over 65 and 70 in Ashland. Uh, but they've done their deal, and they're not working. They're not making salaries to, to, to where, where we can just tax them all the time and, or, or pay the kind of prices that some contractors want to do a job. You know, in, in government, it doesn't work that way. We have to get the best we can possibly get with what we can afford, and that doesn't mean that we hire somebody that can't do good work. So we're gonna, this evaluation process is gonna put people kind of through it to make sure references, where have you done a job? You've done a job like this before? May we go see what you, not only just call the people, we'll go take a look at what you did. And I know we did that in the school system, on the stadium, on the middle school construction and all that. <coughs> so. Uh, yeah, I think it, we got we have a good ordinance. The bottom line is we have a good ordinance. All we're doing is addressing it closer. So, is there any material change to the language in the ordinance? There's no actually. There's no change to the ordinance at all. This is the two attachments that I just uh, referenced, the commissioner, are uh, are in accordance with the ordinance. We can define what those criteria are for vendor qualification. This lays it out specifically in these exhibits. It says uh, here's what they are. The mayor's point. We did. It, it was a healthy exercise. And before I forget, I want to thank the staff because there was a lot of there's a lot of meeting time that went into this, and some you know <coughs> what ifs and you know secondary and tertiary effects. Um, but to your point, Commissioner, more details on written and safety health program, uh, more details on the substance abuse program, uh, ensuring compliance with current federal and state wage and law hour laws, and also language to ensuring equal opportunity, equal employment opportunity. Uh, was addressed so that I think that was all a healthy result of this but so no need no need to change the order can so can any of these requirements that you have changed be uh, changed again in the future and 
would not require board approval. Absolutely. It, we expect it to be iterative. So this goes out there and it goes through a process and somebody says, hey, this was forgotten or what about this? Absolutely can be iterative. But this is in accordance with the, the way the ordinance is written. So any change, no. So any change that has happened in how you handle bidder requests is at the discretion of the city manager. The, the ordinance specifically reads, the city manager may establish a program for vendor pre-qualification. To establish a program for vendor pre-qualification, city manager or administrative personnel so designated by him shall solicit from each prospective vendor sufficient information to permit evaluation of <coughs> qualifications in terms of the following. Four subcategories, the ability and capacity to perform on a timely basis under contract for goods or services he wishes to bid on and supply. Number two, good character, integrity, reputation, and experience. Number three, satisfactory performance in prior dealings with the city. And number four, satisfactory performance in dealings with other local government units, the state and other state governments. My only, my only concern is if, if at any point you want to change the requirements for how we choose a bidder, would you then come before the board? Is that, is this, is this whole process just giving us a, an opportunity to, to have input on it, but it's really not required for us to have input on this part, is that? Body ordinance, that's in fact correct. And so that's why we want to share the information with you all in advance, make sure that if you've got any input on it, or you know, <coughs> will you share that with for advice? Commissioner, if I, if I can make just a little stab at this, the, there, it's a two-fold process. One, before anybody is entitled to bid on a city of Asheville project, they have to either be pre-qualified or qualified. That's in our existing ordinance. And our existing ordinance has the language in there that says what the standards are that they have to meet in order to do that. And that's the language that city manager just read to you, which talks about the uh, <coughs> character, reputation, integrity, expertise, satisfactory performance on previous contracts with the city, uh, satisfactory performance on other contracts. Now, that is something that I wouldn't expect to happen very often is you, you have to ban somebody and say that you're not going to bid on a city contract. But if you've breached a previous contract with us, for instance, you came back to bid another one, I don't know that we're going to pre approve <coughs> or approve you to bid. The second part of the process, and this and that is under both the state statute and under our ordinance, which has similar language, says that you can have evaluated bids, which is different than just simply the lowest bid. It doesn't specify in either the state ordinance or in our ordinance what those evaluated bid criteria are. The staff worked up a, a listing of, I think, 11 evaluated bid criteria, positive things that the way we proposed doing it would be that if you had, uh, I think, 70% of these criteria and you would have been uh, 10 or 15% of the lowest bid, you could be raised up. Now, if you wanted to change those, and that's why we submitted this to all the commissioners to get your input, it wouldn't require a change in the ordinance. It just requires a change in the in the staffing uh, uh, qualifications. Those go out as part of the bid process. So if you send them out on one bid, that's the criteria for that bid. But if you want, if you decide that this is not quite working, we want to change it, we can change it and just next time you bid a project, we, we notify them of what the uh, evaluated bid criteria are that are going to be considered. So it's a long-winded answer, but that's why there's flexibility and why we think our existing ordinance allows us to do whatever you all direct the staff to do in that area. You, and you feel the way the ordinance is written that we are getting the best work and we are also holding the, the subcontractors to account for poor performance? Well, I think this is going to allow us to do a better job of that. that, that that's exactly what it's intended to do. Like anything, it's going to require execution and it's going to require so, enforcement. So do we do we have an ordinance in place that requires the staff to grade performance of? Uh, we do not and, and that's one of the things that we've talked about and the city manager talked about in, in staff meetings is whether or not we ought to also <coughs> identify something that will be put in each file so to speak when a project is, is finished and will be a grade of some sort from the staff so we can say was this you know satisfactory unsatisfactory was this great was this just okay and uh, that's been tossed around as a possibility too because that that can give you some reference to the criteria have you satisfactorily performed a previous contract well you know it'd be nice if we have something that says 
that are they built for you? I can't speak for the board, but I will tell you that it is imperative to me that we grade the contractors and that we document the work completed every project because it is taxpayer money and we would hold a contractor to account for anything we do or have done at home. You bet. And I think it's if we need to put I think honestly it needs to be important <coughs> that we have every city project completed by a subcontractor graded so that we can feel, feel assured that the contractor knows we're grading their work and we as a body can say that to the taxpayer. We are checking every project to make sure it's the best it can be. Well, I agree with what I'm saying. And here's the issue. It's kind of an imperfect system on, on its face because you think it's uh, not so good. You know, it may end up, as we discussed in a couple of work sessions, uh, we may end up in court, which I'm more than happy to do that on behalf of the taxpayers in Boyd County, Kentucky. If we've done our homework and we we can check and balance on whoever is doing the work, uh, for instance, you get a contractor in and and they they get a low bid. And this has happened. I will say this, Commissioner. This is a heck of a good starting point for us. We're so far ahead of the curve on focusing and I, and I really want that word out there. I mean, I don't want anybody to bid the job if they're just not going to you know, do, do the best work for us. The other thing is, and it's not just Ashton, Kentucky, anywhere, people get bids and they're already thinking change orders. And if you look historically, just, just the last two years we've been in office, uh, you know, we can we can look at some of the contracts that doesn't work. Well, you know, if you count the change order, they probably wouldn't have been the low bidder in the first place. I, mean, I, I don't have to give an example. So to me, Major, I think you all have done a, a really good first step there, which may be a long step for us in making sure the public, the taxpayer, get the very best job at, at the price that we intend it to be and not run, run it up. It's, it's a slippery slope on um, who, I'm sure, and I'm just going to leave it up to council, but uh, on the pre-qualification and all that, but if we're doing the things you're asking about and doing this grading system, it, it's, it's, it has more traction. And if it ends up in Boyd County Court, so be it. And that may not be a, a negative at all. I think the, the, the message would be out there, look, we're, we're not going to accept work like this. So. Uh, I think our staff is aware of the intent of this commission. It's very strong intent to get the best for, for what they're bidding and they, they've got references and all that. And those that we already know have not done so well, be able to scratch them. When the bid goes out also, there's a uh, bid, probably the terminology right, but a performance evaluation and that changes based on the project itself. So if it, you know, road versus whatever, things like that. Um, and so that is what they'll be graded on and to have that annotated in the file, you know, you go in and find the <coughs> project or whatever, that's in there with the evaluation. And I think that's probably where there's just a lot of really great conversations and, and the meetings as we're trying to develop this because I think like the mayor is saying, you don't want it to be so restrictive that you've eliminated people from doing business. You want to be able to evaluate them, not just on price, for example. You don't want, we don't want to just say, well, it's was there like you all had said. We want the quality that represents the taxpayers. So I think it is, like Mayor said, a good first step. We'll have the evaluations in there. We have a lot of debates. Is it a you know, one to end list? Is it written? And we feel like based on the engineer techs and an example going out and constantly grading a project, they've got those notes from their logs every day. They do that written evaluation of what that is. It crosses a threshold on this. It's actually 10 criteria on the evaluated bid. Hey, have you successfully completed at least two projects comparable size and complexity? Yes or no? Well, we've got that in the file that says that. So I think, I think we're, I think we're at the same place. Well, I hope that in there, in that grading system, uh, uh, that it, maybe it's worded differently, and maybe when we look at it, we, it doesn't jump out at us. But the thing we talk about all the time, Commissioner, is 
have either on the job or not on the job. And we, we award contracts and they're supposed to start a certain date and you keep driving by and there's nobody there. Nobody's working. Well, we know what's going on. They got another job and they're going to squeeze that in. And, you know, that's okay. Hire more people, you know, to do that other job. I don't want public institutions like school systems and cities, and that's where I'm at now, to be the one left out. But we'll get to you. You know, we've got, we got 130 days to do that job. And they get to about uh, 40 days left, and they come to us and say, you know, we're going to need an extension. You know, we had some bad weather. You got rained one day. I mean, these are things that happen to us, of course. But <coughs> the number of people that actually put on the job site, how many days are on the job site? We know 29th Street was a problem in both those categories. Uh, change orders, major problem. Now, either, either we're not... Either we're not designing the contract right, and whether it's out of engineering, I don't know where it's out, out of, but either either we're doing a very poor job of determining what the job is, because why the wild change order? I don't understand that. And that's historical down here, it really is, so that's why I'm hoping this will be the, and following timelines. If you're supposed to end April 1 on this job, don't come up March 25th and say, well, you know, we had me and sick, you know, uh, one got hurt on the job, and really cut us back and all that. And that's happened, it has happened, and will happen, but all of those things, Counselor, I, I'm assuming would be recorded, kept track of. So as part of the, the, the next time there's a pre-qualification, those things would all come out. It's probably a slow process, <coughs> process that needs to be followed. And if we need to, what the manager has mentioned is the add-ons to that ordinance. <coughs> should we, should we uh, add, as a motion, add those as part of that ordinance, as addendums? Well, we were, we're going to change the ordinance. We'd have to go through first and second reading. I, I think what y'all are talking about has actually been in the works. It's already started to develop a form, so to speak. And I think it was a two or three page form, if I'm not mistaken, that would look at all those factors. So each time a job is finished, the people who had overseen the job would mark that, put it in the file, so we'd have a, a reference. And then the next time you're... Do we need to put that aspect of this process in the ordinance? I think that's the question that we're all asking. You can. Well, you, I mean, need I, to, you need to tell us whether we should I think I think it's essential that that be required. I don't think it needs to be flexible. I think, I think the taxpayers expect us to have every project reviewed that they have their money spent on. I would, I would suggest that if you do it, rather than making the actual form a part of the uh, ordinance, that you just say that there will be one. Because yeah. if you make the actual form part of it, yeah. and every time somebody wants to tweak it a little bit, you got to go back and amend the ordinance. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can go back to the next meeting. I think just saying that, that we'll projects will be reviewed. We do, do, do three readings of an addendum to that ordinance, not change the ordinance, but this, I, again, I'm not trying to take the spot, but, <laughs> but say, uh, you know, we would like to, to no. add an addendum to that. I know what the minister's talking about. It'd be, it'd be easy to do it. You'll find the, the longer we're down there working on stuff like this, if it's not written, it didn't happen, it ain't going to happen. And that gives the commission, you know, more more authority in the process. And I understand exactly. We'll bring it back to the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, man? Okay. Anybody? Okay. Uh, this part of our meeting is public participation, and we would ask you if you have something you'd like to bring before uh, the board of commissioners. We'll ask you to give your name and address, and keep your comments five minutes or less. Yours doesn't count. You get up and say as long as you want, because you've got a whole group. Yes, sir. You've got a whole group here. Thank you. If you'd like to, or anybody, any students, want, or. I've been in front of you guys before. I'm Melissa Rigsby. I'm the Ashland, um, the old Ashland College. Yeah. And the process of the, submitting the um, applications for the CBDG grants um, mm -hmm. just completed. I think last week was that the fourth. That those were due. I think they were they were due the fourth. So I just wanted to give you guys some. I've, I've got one for each commissioner. I'm, I had to put it in with three um, with the application. So hopefully 
That was for the rest of you guys. And Melissa, what's your address? Um, oh, I'm sorry. You want my personal address? Yeah, the address so, of the so the record. 84 State Route 854, Rush Bay. But the property is 1420 Central Avenue. Uh, We're aware. all familiar with that. Very aware. So I made each of you a packet because um, when I talked to Ms. Woolery in, in economic development and asked if there was any help with navigating this application process, she very kindly advised me to um, contact my attorney and that was good advice because I don't know if any of you have ever read through the block grant program or the national and federal incentives and objectives. Probably not, Liz. <laughs> well, I have six weeks. I've studied it and I've hired two people to help me study it. So with, with studying that and the research that I've got went through, I would like to share some, I think, pertinent information that pertains to my application in case it does make it in front of you guys to vote on. Okay. Is that okay? So absolutely. Give fair part. Does anyone want a copy of the national objectives or the um, development off the top of grant program? You know, I go, I go to bed real early. <laughs> <laughs> now, I might put those on my and pillow. And there's some letters of support bed. from the community <coughs> in here as well. Well, we can submit those in support of the application. There is a process for a committee that reviews the application, reviews all of the applications, and then makes recommendations, <coughs> which ultimately, if there's a recommendation to grant, it comes before the commission. So it's probably not appropriate to consider specifics of any particular application here at this time, because all the applicants uh, submit what they have. It goes before committee and it's reviewed in that process. But we can certainly accept and receive what you have if you you haven't already filed an application. If I have. Yes, I have filed the application, and this information is just in case my application makes it in front of you guys. You know the research and work that was involved in the application process, and that I did do my due diligence. Okay. That's all. We appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yes. Come on, yeah. my favorite people, one of my former teachers, and a fellow pet lover, yeah. and you are, and you're with. Okay, I'm Kathy Queen, uh, 2519 Auburn Avenue here in Ashland. Um, I'm a retired teacher and educator here in Ashland, Kentucky. 27 years I devoted to my children. Now I have a new avenue, um, the well-being of our animals in this community. And when I heard that there was some going to be some discussion about some new ordinances, hopefully that we can, in, you know, do for our community, I wanted to be involved. And all I can say is that we, as a community, can do much better than what we're doing now. Um, and, you, and your organization is? I'm with Ashland Animal Rescue, but ARC, and we've been around since 2009, and I've been with them since 2010. But post retirement, this is full time volunteer work for me. Um, we have some models within our state. Our current laws in Kentucky are very <coughs> vague, um, but we can do better because Louisville and Lexington have devised some models and they have enforced these models in their community for the well being and safety of the animals. Um, this past couple of weeks, whenever we had the terrible temperatures, and I know our animal control does a fabulous job. They did. We depend on them. They work well with us. Our Boyd County Shelter does a good job. But their hands are tied too. So it all comes down to language, how things are set up and what is doable. So we would like to be a part of this ordinance or whatever we are going to plan to do as a community um the calls are relentless you know animals freezing to death what is shelter according to the state it's three sides and a roof that is it no bottom no bedding nothing um you know there's a lot of things that can be added to what we can make doable and we are in support of that um, we also need to hold people accountable, and I think that's something that we can do as a community that won't require anything far more than what we're already doing, except to a better degree. So I would like to offer our support 
and my personal support. And if we can be on a committee, any of us, any of our members, we can do something better. That's just what I feel like. I'm proud of this community. I've lived here all my life. I came <coughs> back here and became an educator here. But I feel like this is something that is truly lacking the well-being of our personal pets and making people responsible. So we we agree and, and let me assure you our input. Commissioner? Yeah. yeah, let me let me jump in here for just a second and this may make you feel better as well. Yesterday when we were in Frankfurt we had a great conversation with Representative Clark mm -hmm. and she informed us that she has filed a bill in the state legislature to define shelter, to define mm -hmm. the tether and the enclosure and all of that. So that that language they're working on tightening up all of that because that's that's a hole in the in the law. Um, so just so this commission knows so that you're aware that is making its way through the state legislature. Well that's now. correct. She filed it on Friday. That's correct because Kentucky is fiftieth. Yeah. And that's just not acceptable in my opinion. Yeah. Well we, we'll have we'll have to stand tall on this and but we have to do it with reason. There's nobody <coughs> that you know, I have four dogs and a cat three birds. <laughs> yeah, leave them out. But, you know, uh, keeping in mind that the state uh, makes a regulation, I appreciate uh, Representative Clark working on this so quickly. Uh, the city can make it more stringent. Exactly. We can't make it less stringent, but we can make it more stringent because we kind of know our community and our area, some of our neighborhoods. The, the mayor's office gets calls on all the time. People are worried about the pets down the street, the pet next door, whatever that's out in this sub freezing weather with nothing. Uh, I think it's everybody's responsibility to be involved in some way. I truly do. And the people that get all gyrated and upset are the ones who need to get gyrated and upset. I totally agree. Now, what we can do enforcement wise, the chief, we, of course, you know, we got to depend on law enforcement. And, you know, there's a line there on, on them, and, and it, it makes it difficult for them. You know, a lot of people, if you pull a car out in front of their house, they're probably going to conform. Exactly. Uh, you don't have to do much of anything. But, but the, the, the biggest offenders, yeah, I don't care. You don't care about anything. So we, we're looking for things that uh, our officers can deal with, or we can, our, our uh, control people, and control people, can make a contact with Calisburg. You know, some way that we can apply to the courts to, to make, you know, send something down, the county attorney, send a warning down. Hey, <coughs> you gotta do better you know, with this. You know, if not us, who? Who's gonna take care of these poor pets that people don't care about? They wanna have them, but they don't care about them. Uh, I'm, I'm in that corner, so. Well, thank you. And as well, thank you, Kathy. We can do better. Yes, we can, and I commend you all for even considering this because it takes a village to get everything done yeah. and I feel Ashland's village is very strong and I'm proud of this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I'm up. Mike Maynard, 1819 Eloise Street. I'm the executive director for Hillcrest Bruce Mission and uh, wanted to make sure and bring attention to uh, the really good article that was in the paper this this last week on the bus system, and it really highlighted uh, how essential an effective bus system is uh, for the city and its residents, and it did a really good job of highlighting the paratransit that's available for our folks that have physical limitations and are elderly uh, that need to get from point to point. Um, and, and what I'm going to say, this will touch upon the discussion that we've had over the last month uh, about the buggies that have been you know, left throughout the city and, and your all's efforts in trying to curb some of that. Um, and, and one of the things that we think about when we see the buggies everywhere is that you know, why, why are they there? Yeah. Um, why does somebody want to push a buggy full of groceries from Kroger down 6th Street, up 6th Street Hill all the way to the top of Hillcrest? Why would somebody want to do that? Yeah. You know, or push a buggy back all the way up to Walmart? And, and the reason is, is because some of the inconveniences of bus routes, bus times, and things of that nature. Um, and one of the things that most people aren't aware of, if, if you don't ride the bus system and you don't have to go to places that you need to go to, you're not aware that if you were to get on the bus stop at Hillcrest and you wanted to go to Kroger's and come back, that just <coughs> happens to be on the bus route that only runs every other hour. It takes four hours 
to get on the bus to go to Kroger's to shop wait until that next bus comes around to get back to Hillcrest. Four hours. This is really the reason of why we have a buggy issue. It's part of the inconvenience. Part of it is too, I mean, you have limited space on a bus. You're not, you can't do a month's worth of grocery shopping and get all your bags on there. And then you're gonna get dropped off at a bus stop. And so you have to walk to your house, to your apartment, and those kind of places. So what we've seen over the my last two years of being at Hillcrest and Bruce is that when you have a, a congregation of a large number of folks who mostly have limited or unreliable transportation, the bus route needs to be very robust in those locations to serve <coughs> They have places they gotta go. If, if you've not been without a car, you have no idea how inconvenient and how much freedom you have given up. Because to go to a grocery store, if you have to get your child on the bus in the morning, you have to wait until that's done. If you have to get your child off the Head Start bus when they come home, you have to make sure everything is done within that time. And there's necessities for folks who have limited transportation. Usually, they are in a lower economic class that requires them to go to other places to either get assistance, go to agencies, child services, social security office, um, DCBS, all these different things. And so, and I know in, in the article it talks about, and the bus system has done a great job of analyzing and assessing the need for longer hours, you know, to support folks who are working that don't finish work by 4.30. In the evening. Uh, they've looked at doing Saturday service to support folks who are off from work, that are working uh, jobs, that they can go grocery shopping on a Saturday. And so I think the, the bus folks <coughs> and, the, and, the, uh, and the finance office, I think they've done a great job of looking at the needs of what needs to happen for our folks But for, that we've been talking about for the last couple of years. <laughs> we need to do something. I know we've done surveys with folks who are riding the bus, and that's great. The only people that are riding the bus are the folks that it's convenient for. If it's not convenient for you, you're not riding the bus, and I'm sure we probably missed a lot of folks who would ride the bus if the routes were more convenient and times were more convenient. Now, I, mean, I don't have an answer for the routes or things like that, but, and I know they've been looking at it, but to better support our community, and especially those that have limited transportation, we need to alter and adjust the bus routes the whole thing, we need a complete revamping of how our bus works so that we can support folks. And I think if you make public transportation convenient and easy, I think you'll get rid of most of your buggy issues. I agree. We've had several of these conversations. I know you and I have been in a couple of meetings where we've, we've talked about, we have, a, we have a great bus service and we turned that over to finance last year and they've done a great job with it and it's, it's doing wonderfully. But I think again, we've got to go one step further and say, are we, are if, if, and I've said this for what, four or five years now, four years now at least, if we're gonna go in the hole for the bus system, can we not at least make it so that it benefits the most people the most of the time? And um, I, like I said, I know you and I have had several conversations about about <coughs> rerouting and and putting those buses in places and in times that they're actually needed. So just sort of make it around the city. And I don't know how that works and I can't even, I can't, I can't say that I it's, have a solution. I just, yeah, it's far easier. I just say that we need yeah, to do this. Said it done. Yeah. And I've been on commission to stand here historically. We had the same discussion we're having right now, 30 years ago. And it's, uh, I don't know of another city in Kentucky with 22,000 people has a bus system. I don't know even 50,000 maybe have a bus system, but bus systems are antiquated in communities. One of the reasons is, even the people, the people don't want to be on schedule. At least don't want to be on schedule. <coughs> and uh, I, I will say, and I'm, I want to make a couple of comments. I'll let Mr. Grubb address it a little bit. Uh, he and Michelle, his assistant, they, they kind of took this over uh, because they felt like they needed to take it over. And they're doing an unbelievable job on it. They've changed routes. They, they, they've done all kinds of uh, adjustments for people. And as we make adjustments, the key, Mike, is you you try to do something like schedule something where people and, and listen. I, unless you're without transportation, it's kind of hard to plug into it. 
uh, we're, we're all, you know, our kids more than anybody. They're they're either going to be picked up or they're going to drive themselves or whatever. And then you, we got a major element. I'm talking about taxpayers last. I'm talking about you know older part of the community. And then we have a whole another element: unemployed, handicapped, whatever the case may be, unable to get the employment, and they make up large segments of our community. But in order to tailor something to suit everyone, it's very, very difficult. So I'm confident, I'm not gonna speak for them, and I'll let Mr. Grubb address it a little bit. But the truth of it is, no matter what they do, uh, they'll do a trial, and they've done that for years. You know, we, we, you know, sometimes you kind of go with not just the squeaky wheel, you go with people that, you know, a group of people kind of say, you know, we, you know, we're going to have a group of people come and say they need to be go to King's Daughters Hospital for an hour and be picked up and brought back home because they got to visit people a whole lot. They do it all for <coughs> care or treatment. Um, they need to get to the bank. They can't get to the bank, so we're going to have to get to the bank and back even less time. I mean, some people probably going to ask that. But anyway, there, there are hundred considerations once you say, well, and, and I know going grocery shopping is, is a real, everybody has to do that. I mean, every day, uh, not every day, but you know, on a weekly basis usually. Uh, but whatever can be implemented, and, he, and probably right now that uh, Mr. Grubb and Ms. Beach are probably doing some runs, trial runs now to see what ridership is. Now, if, if the buses were full every day, we would be a losing proposition. So don't get me wrong, but I'm saying if you pick up the numbers of people, it's gonna make everything okay. We, we're willing to run the system uh, at a loss. The government matches you know, some, of, some of those funds, but not all of them, because we think it is important. We think it is a, uh, we think it's kind of a feather in our cap in Ashland to have a bus system. Uh, that kind of delineates <coughs> us as a progressive community, because more and more people every year are needing more and more transportation, no matter where they are. Uh, <coughs> But the taxpayers in Ashland have to put that bill, if you do too many routes, that people aren't gonna run. And, and obviously the real miraculous thing you're looking for is you put a route in on a Saturday to get people to the store and get them back within an hour and all that. And the buses are full or half full or three, whatever the case may be. Again, uh, there are a lot of free riders or a lot of reduced rides and all that. I guess I want to emphasize the point, if they're full, it's not going to make up what it's cost us to do it. But since that's the case, I think she already mentioned it, since that's the case, let's, let's do the best we can to get people where they need to be and back at a reasonable time. It isn't easy. And Mr. Grubb, I'm, I'm prefacing this for you. If you, want to, if you want to come up and tell us how you do that and how you um, trial what, or whatever. What about that, sir, other than we are taking the notes here, and we'll certainly brief you. Uh, <coughs> we hope to start a Saturday service, uh, maybe uh, first of the, or, I'm sorry, the last part of March, April the 1st, in that time frame. But we haven't taken the notes, and we'll certainly be good. We feel like we're going to come back to the last contract. Uh, yeah. Well, well the, other, the other critical part of this, and I think you've got to be mindful of, is we want our people to work. And if the biggest challenge for them is transportation, you know, I, I, that's the only thing I think we all want to do is to make sure the hours are convenient to, to get our people to work and, and back from work. And some of the things we've dealt with as a board is unemployment. And uh, I think you can use the bus as an economic development tool to get people back to work. And uh, I just, I hope when we do evaluate that, uh, the times that we're also asking business owners when they need their employees at work, so we know that's when we need those bus routes to be running. That's the only thing I have to add. I, I think we can tweak this. I think we can fix it. I really do. And then adding the Saturday service, I think, is a step in the right direction. I think they'll work with you. Yeah. Just want to do the most good. And I appreciate all you're doing. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. You have your hands full, we appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Anyone else? Those students want to take a shot? 
Star, get a star. I'll call your teacher. Okay, we appreciate y'all being here. Mr. Williams, you all to stay home meeting? Yes, sir, if you don't care, sir. We're glad Please, sir. Glad to have you. Sir. Does that mean if you don't, you'll have to entertain them yourself? Yes, sir, that's exactly it. <laughs> and I've already been on duty all morning. I'm sure you have. All right, uh, old business out of night. Second reading and adoption of an ordinance entitled an ordinance to the city of Ashland, Kentucky, authorized and directed the mayor to execute a contract between the city of Ashland and Summit Fence Company, Inc., the amount of $26,990 for the purchase and installation of fencing, gates, and all appurtenances for the Department of Public Services and Utility Operations. Division of Water Distribution and Wastewater Collection in Mill Street facility. So moved. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed the like sign. Item B. Second reading and adoption of an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the City of Ashland, Kentucky, authorizing the director of the mayor to execute a contract between the City of Ashland and Service Pump and Supply Inc. in the amount of $58,364 for the purchase and installation of the 26th Street Sewage Station Channel Grinder Replacement Project. For the Department of Public Services and Utility, Utility Operations Division of Wastewater Collection. Second. A discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Like sign. Item C. Second reading and adoption of an ordinance, <coughs> ordinance of the City of Ashland, Kentucky, adopting the revised job description for the position of laboratory technician in the Division of Water Treatment Plant. The revised job description for the position of solid waste worker one in the Division of Fleet Maintenance Solid Waste both in the Department of Public Services and Utility Operations and amending the authorized positions listing of the policies and procedures compensation plan and classification plan as adopted by ordinance number 51, series of 2017, as previously amended. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign, on D. <coughs> Second reading and adoption of an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the City of Ashton, Kentucky, authorized and directed to the mayor to execute a contract between the City of Ashton, Kentucky and Daniel Runyon, DBA Daniels Lawn Care, for the purchase of all labor for the abatement of high grass and weeds on residential lots throughout the city limits of Ashton for the Department of Community and Economic Development. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. A reason that we are, everybody's real cordial in approving these, we've already read these in another meeting. And in city government, you have to have two readings, uh, two separate meetings for something to pass. So <coughs> all of us have read these, the background material on these before, and these are brought over. This is the second reading, of them, which finalized. Just so you know, we just don't sit here and say, okay, yeah, yeah, we're all for that. We had some pretty good discussions on the first readings many times. Sorry, I mean. Second reading and adoption of an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the City of Ashland, Kentucky, authorizing and directing the mayor to execute a deed of conveyance between the City of Ashland, Kentucky, and the Harvey Family Limited Partnership regarding the acceptance of the donation of 11 lots located near the Charles and Betty Russell Park Trail property. So moved. Second. Well, I, I, part of my discussion will be uh, I want to make sure we get a letter to them that we all sign. Okay, Major, you put, I can put a letter together if you got yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to thank them for that donation. All in favor? Opposed, <coughs> uh, like sign. Item F. Second reading and adoption of an ordinance entitled an Ordinance of the City of Ashland, Kentucky, authorizing and directing the mayor to execute an agreement between the City of Ashland and Rob Fields regarding an encroachment for a sign at 1516 Central Avenue on the city's right of way. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed, like sign. Item G. Second reading and adoption of an ordinance entitled an ordinance to the City of Ashland, Kentucky, authorizing and directing the mayor to execute an agreement between the City of Ashland, Kentucky and Dixon Engineering, Inc. for professional engineering services for the preparation of bid specifications for the coating, painting, and repairing of the Summit Water Storage Tank in an amount not to exceed $4,500. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed, like sign, item H. Second reading and adoption of an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the City of Ashland, Kentucky, amending ordinance number 47, series of 1982, as previously amended by ordinance number 101, series of 2015, which requires an application for permission to make cuts and excavations in public rights of way, sets the fee for such permit and the penalty for violations of the ordinance. 
Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Any other business? <coughs> Consent agenda. Uh, resolution of the City of Ashland, Kentucky, adopting, authorizing, and approving the course of action presented by the city manager on the items appearing on the consent agenda for the regular meeting of the Board of City Commissioners of February 14th, 2019. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. New business item A. First reading and approval of an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the City of Ashland, Kentucky, authorizing and directing the mayor to execute a mutual aid agreement between the City of Ashland, Kentucky Fire Department and the Tri-State Airport Authority Fire Rescue. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. I be. First reading and approval of an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the City of Ashland, Kentucky, authorizing and directing the mayor to execute task order number 23 between the City of Ashland, Kentucky and Strand Associates, Inc. regarding the 2018 annual combined sewer overflow reports for the Department of Public Services and Utility Operations in an amount not to exceed $15,000. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I have a question. Uh, Mr. Eastwood, yeah. do, do we uh, do we have to send reports to the federal government on our combined sewer overflows? Yes, we do yearly. That's what this. That's what this is. is. Okay. You know there are a lot of cities that haven't commenced this yet. Yeah. All over the country, really, right across the river, is one of them. I know. And I don't know. I remember when we started this. <coughs> it was going to be. Uh, I think. I think they said. Ten thousand dollars a day. If you, if, you know, remember fine. that? Were you here then? Uh, I wasn't here then, but the fine structure was supposed to be commensurate to what it cost you in savings. Uh, so ten thousand dollars a day might have been a minimum. Yeah. But it was going to be really good. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I think it's a combined sewer overflow system that we were mandated to put in in Ashland, Kentucky, as other every other municipality in America. And it was the right thing to do, but just like when it is the right thing and the federal government mandates it, they're gonna fine you if you don't, but they don't give you any money to do it. You just do it yourselves. Our estimate for completing ours is, was how much? Um, for all the projects, it's about $43 million. You know what we do with $43 million in the city of Ashland? We did the mine sewer overflows. That's what we did with it. But we're not, we're not quite finished. It's <coughs> a ton of money for a place like Ashland. And it was a federal mandate. And what it did, we had, had a lot of, um, we had a lot of uh, systems where sewage, rainwater, and storm, storm drains were overflowing, mixing and our storm drains head to the river. So we had raw sewage going to the river and that was the right thing to do. But there's so few communities doing the right thing because it costs too much. But Ashland, Kentucky stepped up and the, from several years ago, I mean, how years ago we've been doing it, Ryan? Um, since about 2010 was the first project. Yeah, well, uh, and a lot of communities haven't addressed yet. But it's the right thing to do to keep that affluent, that type of affluent, out of the river. But you can imagine from here, just from here to Pittsburgh, what's going on in that river. The communities aren't doing that and haven't done it. But we, we weren't about to get our, have our taxpayers pay a fine. Uh, so we, we embarked on it and we're, we're near a, a reasonable ending, all right? Yes, the last project we had is the sewer treatment plant expansion, which is the largest project, but um, after that we'll be, we'll be completed. Yeah, so all over town, all over the areas, north, south, east, and west of Ashland, we, we've done construction and brought these lines together to protect what goes in the river. That's a big deal. Mayor, one, one other point, correct me on the statistics, uh, <coughs> Mr. Eastwood, but uh, on the 29th Street alone, what we've diverted from not going to the wastewater treatment plant, so stormwater is 250,000 gallons a day on a dry day. Yes, and, that's uh, enough to fill Dawson Pool about it one and a half times. And then on a wet weather event, we've, we've had a uh, 
basically a monitor in there at 1.8 million gallons that did not have to go through the wastewater treatment plant as a result of the 29. 3.5. 3.5. A little bit off. <coughs> and, uh, so it does save us there. For the month of December, we could have filled Dawson Pool, I think it's 450 times with the amount of storm water that would have gone through the plant otherwise with that project. So it's a remarkable achievement. Yeah, that's that's the other side of this. You know, I'm talking about the, the real downside of sewage going in the river. And they're, they're telling you about the downside of rainwater going into our sewer treatment plant, and we're treating it like it was polluted water. And it can easily go in the river, but so that, there's the savings. It takes, takes a, a, few, a few decades to recoup 43 million, of course, at that rate. But and that rainwater was displacing sewage that could have gone into the sewer treatment plant otherwise. Yeah. So, for that 450 Dawson pools that would be filled, you can guess that we are now treating that amount of sewage that would have otherwise probably been discharged. Good point. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Proposed. Are we ready to have a healthy discussion on this? Uh, proposal and report to Yes, Mayor. Um, End of January, uh, Commissioner sent uh, an email asking uh, us to look into strengthening animal cruelty laws for Ashland. Uh, Ms. Queen already touched a little bit on it. Specifically, uh, to add provisions, to look at adding provisions uh, that follow the laws in Pennsylvania. Uh, in, these included improved tethering conditions for outside dogs, no more than nine hours tethered in the 24-hour period. Uh, the tether must be longer of uh, three times the length of dog or 10 feet. No more than 30 minutes in 90 plus or 30 minus 32 degree weather. Must have water and shade. Must be secured by an appropriate collar, no tow or log chain or choke pinch prong or chain collars. Tethered space must be clear of excessive waste, no open sores, wounds on the dog's body. Additionally, animals, animals must be provided sanitary shelter that allows the animal to maintain normal body temperature and keep animals dry all year. Uh, the staff, we got together very briefly. We've got uh, Ryan Felty from the garage and also Dave Branham, our animal control officer. Uh, staff met, we came up with some very simple pros and cons, which have already been touched on a little bit um, for the uh, open comment section. Uh, but three pros, and they're very simple, but more clarity on definition of guidelines. Uh, education residents for more effective self-compliance and would show more caring and support on behalf of the city of uh, Ashland. One of the things that uh, as we had the discussion, I made a comparison to what we do in code enforcement. Uh, roughly on code enforcement, we send out violations, 80% of people comply. Uh, 85%, <coughs> Mr. Fulham could give you details on that. In our discussions with Dave Branham, he said the vast majority of people, when they know about uh, our, our ordinance, do comply, upwards of 90%. Um, and so the, those are on the pro side. If you put something out like that and people know it, most people are, are, will follow it. They're going to do the right thing. Uh, on the con side, uh, the negative side, it would be very difficult to enforce without voluntary compliance. Um, could not access. So if you're looking on the time limitations, you have to have somebody, and I'll ask for legal on this, to, to add further depth. Um, but you physically have to have somebody watching that for that time period. Uh, could not access private property without a search warrant. Uh, time constraints make difficult to enforce. Make it difficult to enforce visual evidence. Uh, removes the animal control officer discretions on a case by case basis, and gives more leverage to disputing neighbors. I think, generally speaking, we do follow the broad KRS guidance. Um, Dave has, excuse me, Mr. Branham has prosecuted 13 cases of animal cruelty in the last 12 years under the auspices of the KRS, and has been successful on all of those. Um, trying to think if there's anything else from the staff, if there's anything else that I missed on that for adding to kick off the discussion. So Chief, we, we had to send an officer to Catsburg to get a, a warrant for a search. If we run into a, a situation where the property owner won't allow us access, uh, or we can't see it visually, you know, from a, a field of view uh, from the public side, uh, we're going to have to have the evidence, you know, uh, already to get, obtain a search warrant to go in and inspect. Um, uh, there, there, we, during this, we've researched and found uh, <laughs> that it does require us to obtain a search warrant to continue an investigation in this. So, 
that uh, kind of intensifies the uh, the need to already have good solid information or evidence. So it's it's a restriction for us, and it's it falls under the Fourth Amendment to you know to unauthorized search and seizure. How many of these are you called on? Uh, in some of the statistics I supplied the uh, city manager, uh, I researched for the month of January, and animal calls or animal nuisance calls are vary from everything from a barking dog to the check the welfare uh, officers even initiating a welfare check, and of course we have we have a large deer population, that, you know we have collisions in in the city. Uh, we answered over 30 calls. In the month of January, on animal complaints, people, fortunately, I guess you know, will tune in a little bit better when it's freezing weather to to how people handle pets or, or the animal. Uh, I, so I, I yeah, can also what, what just just to, to complement Chief's information. I apologize for not sharing this. Uh, last year, Mr. Brown provided in 2018. A uh, total of 623 service calls. Uh, of that breakdown, 343 to the Boyd County Animal Shelter, 147 on dogs, 339 on cats, and 177 other. Is there anything else to add on that, Mr. Brown? So, wait a minute. So, how many total did you say for the year? 623 service calls. And one prosecution per year? Well, that could be a barking dog. So there's only probably one instance. Probably four years when I'll have to do animal cruelty prosecution. How many animal cruelty calls do you get versus barking dog? Probably two to one. What is it? Two to one. Two. So it's out of 300 calls, there are animal cruelty. 100 of them. At, oh, at minimum. At minimum, 100 of them would have been animal cruelty. Or check the welfare. So out of They're one, just unfounded. So out of how many were unfounded? All of them. If it's founded, it's, it's prosecuted. Years. If I go out, if I get an answer, check the welfare call. And, you, and, and you're saying unfounded based on the way the, the legislation's written, based on the, the law, the way you have to follow it? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, Mr. Brown is outstanding. Absolutely. And I might add this, I've chased dogs with him before. <laughs> I don't, I hate to tell you, one of them mine, a rescue dog. Remember all over South yes. Africa? And uh, <laughs> somebody told me, he said, hey, one of the kid I used to, he said, Coach Gilmore, he said, it's over by Uni Baptist Church. We were over around Jackson and that, that's all. Uh, big white dog is the spot. But, uh, but but there was another one that looked just like mine. It also caused a problem like that. But we chased all of them. We got it. We finally got it. But let me say this, <coughs> just just as a side, and I don't say this other than I want you to be maybe have a little more pride in Ashland, Kentucky, and who you are as a citizen. We have absolutely zero responsibility to have an animal control officer. We don't have to hire somebody, have a truck, gasoline. Da -da -da -da. We bought you a new one a couple years ago. <laughs> Not this year. Yeah. 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 Or call, maybe call somebody else into public works to help him on an issue or whatever the case be. That, that's a county responsibility in the state of Kentucky. It's 100% county obligation. We do it as a service to our citizens because they deserve it and they should have it. And this is not a slam against county. You know, they can't. I don't know how long we've had one, as long as I remember. I mean, when I was a kid, we had a dog catcher, well, we called them all the time. Uh, he's using my dog, they were after him all the time. But it isn't our responsibility, but we're happy to do it. We're proud that we, we, we do it as an extra, an extra impetus on protecting the pets as well as protecting the residents, you know, throughout. But, you know, they can't speak for themselves. And I don't care if it's a nice warm day in the summer and they're starving. It really doesn't make a whole lot of difference whether they're freezing at that time if they're starving. And, uh, and abused and neglected on a nice warm day or a really hot day, it makes no difference. And, and somebody does speak for them. And I know people that speak for them every day. 
we need to speak for them. We, we need to do all we can to protect any kind of abuse to animals within the law and not, you know, and, and such that our police officers, uh, you know, aren't handcuffed themselves by what they can do when they want to do something. But I don't, you know, I don't, and I don't care about going to court. I'll show up, you know, whatever the case may be. I think the major is probably pretty accurate. The majority, vast majority of people are law abiding. If we get a, a citation from us or the, the animal control has to let them know, hey, you, you know, you can't do that. You gotta, you know, people follow it. <coughs> the ones that no one follows. Who speaks for those pets? Well, we, we've got to do something. How many citations last year, Mr. Brown? In the last two years, I've only done one. Okay. And I don't remember if that was last year or the year before. Any frozen dogs? None. In the 12, 12 years I've done this, none. Well, I think. Unreported or that we don't know. I was going to say, I was gonna say in, in, in regards to that argument that obviously we don't have any deaths from freezing animals. The question is then if you use that same rationale with child abuse laws, then you would never have child abuse laws in place because yes, there's not that many child abuse deaths, but you also also have to have pretty clear child abuse statutes because people still abuse their kids and they will abuse their pets. Well and and in that vein, we know right now that that the Kentucky State Legislature is working through the statute. And so I don't know where that leaves us, but. Well, I, I think we have an opportunity that doesn't require the weight on the state because we don't have the two bodies to, to flesh out. We can, we can flesh it out here amongst us. And, and I don't think there's anything that we're putting, that we're even talking about that isn't common sense. No, it's common sense, but how many more animal control officers do we need to enforce that? Our local law enforcement's answering close to 50,000 calls a year already, and we cannot put that on them. There would be no change the way I'm reading it. This is not a change in the law. It's actually clarifying the existing law so that it gives the officer the opportunity to be able to charge if we do not have an ordinance right now that says your dog cannot be outside for longer than nine hours. That's not in our current ordinance. Right. It's so pretty, that's that's something so, new that would have to be enforced. And the challenge and the chief is telling us that somebody's gonna have to have eyes on that dog for nine hours well, to again that's that. that's why we discuss it just for common sense mm -hmm. analysis. Yeah, sir, let me ask you. You know, how many times do I bring up to the commission, too? We don't have to reinvent a wheel now. No. So, so in your research, and I know you've done some on this, on the specific on it, what, what would you in, uh, tell us that uh, gives some guidance on this? Well, all right, here's the situation as I understand. First of all, the criminal offense of cruelty to animals is defined under state law, not under city law. And currently, it's a class A misdemeanor, which means it's punishable by up to a year in jail, which is authority we don't have with respect to the uh, local ordinances. It is, it is, as somebody pointed out, um, somewhat vague. It prohibits mutilation, beating, torturing any animal other than a dog or cat, tormenting, telling to provide adequate food, drink, space, health care, or by any other means. Now, the official comments to that ordinance were written by Bob Lawson, who was the criminal law professor at the University of Kentucky, he was my criminal law professor. If you talk to any lawyer in Kentucky who went to the UK, they'll tell you he's the absolute authority on that. And in his comments, he said he specifically did not define some of those terms because he thought it, was, it would be more appropriate to allow a common sense approach and allow juries to determine what was adequate food, what was adequate drink, what was adequate space, what was adequate health care. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that we couldn't have, a, we have local ordinances that go beyond this criminal statute, and they say, for instance, that you're gonna have a tag, uh, that you can't be barking as a nuisance, and so on. Those are enforceable by fines, not by, by up to a year in jail. So, could we go and define some of these terms as a local ordinance, and have our animal control people enforce with violations and fines? I think we could. Uh, what may be on in the works of it, I wasn't aware of it until Commissioner Clark brought it up, that apparently there's a move afoot in the legislature to amend this 
to go another way than, than Professor Lawson did and say, no, let's be more specific about. What Representative and, Clark said to me is that she wants a definition for each of those, food, drink, space, health care. That's, that's in her bill. And that would certainly be another way to go. And if that happened, then after <coughs> prosecuting the Brown cruelty with the potential jail sentence, would the, if they use the same type of definitions as in this Pennsylvania uh, statute, you'd be able to look at these things. Now, it's not going to change the enforcement problems that the chief has, in that it's still going to be difficult to determine whether a dog was uh, outside for nine hours out of 24 or not. And, and my personal opinion is uh, that Professor Lawson's approach was probably better because when you just say they have to provide adequate food, you don't have to say that they got to have 12 ounces of, of food a day. You can look at a dog and say, this dog's not being adequately fed and you can prosecute. But I understand the other approach. I understand the, the need in some of the organizations that have said, no, we would rather have specific guidelines. So I think you, you can do it anyway, but we're somewhat limited. We can adopt them locally. Our enforcement is not going to be as, is likely to, to have effect in the sense that if you got to pay a twenty dollar fine, that's one thing. You got to go to jail for it. That's another. Uh, so, but it's up to you all. Uh, I think it's probably it might be worthwhile to see what the legislature does. Is anything we all know just because the bill's introduced doesn't mean it's going to get passed. But I would suspect that this is the kind of bill that may have a lot of support, uh, and it may solve the problem for us. Uh, but I guess we won't know that until the legislature adjourns, probably in April. So that was a long-winded answer, I guess. If it was me, what, what do I think the best approach is? I like the general approach that uh, uh, Professor Lawson had as to the animal cruelty. Uh, I think we could add some of these provisions to our local ordinance, even if it is only a fine. I think that we should look at the ones that are easier to enforce. I think, the, uh, for instance, the length of tether, that's easy to enforce. The types of collars that you're gonna ban, you know, you, you can look at that, either it is or isn't. How many hours is, is the dog outside? That's gonna be impossible to enforce. So I personally wouldn't recommend that. Shelter to go. As I tell you all the time, I'm just a draftsman. You know, it's up to you all to decide what you want to yeah, do. Yeah, I think shelter is a big deal. Shelter very adequately, I think that's Shelter can be defined, yes. That's also in Representative Representative Clark pointed that out specifically. She mentioned it yesterday. I'm, I'm all for this. I mean, uh, but uh, we have to be very careful about the, because of the enforcement yeah. and how we're going to enforce it. And these, you know, you have subjective situations where a neighbor doesn't like another neighbor. So she's constantly calling and, and complaining on the neighbor's dog or cat or whatever. And then you have a domestic dispute. Uh, so that's my only thing. I'm a dog lover. I have dogs. The dogs are inside and they sleep with us, they eat with us. and. Uh, I got four cats, and, and uh, you know I'm, a, I'm an animal lover. Last year at this time, there was a dog uh, outside chained on a block of ice on the, on the corner of Gartrell. Several calls to get this dog. And I went out to Rural King and got to crawl up in a tractor trailer and got the last bale of straw. And took straw in a dog house and, and food and water. And I just knocked on the door. I said, here, here, this is for your dog. And she just stand there and looked at me. So you can't fix stupid. A lot of these people. What can you say? You know, she didn't say thank you. She didn't say anything. <coughs> Did she take the straw into her house? Uh, she, uh, well, it was laying there when I left there, uh, so I don't know. But I, I kind of moved it around for, in the doghouse for the dog. But she finally moved away. I mean, if we'd have gave her a ticket, big deal. She'd have thrown that in file thirteen somewhere. But it's it's very the enforcement is what is the clincher. And uh, it's a common sense thing. If you got a husky or a malamute or a German shepherd or something like that, my, my dogs like that don't want to come inside. They want to stay outside in the snow and ice. So it's very, you got to use common sense. Now if it's a little, you know, a little chihuahua or something like that with short hair, a little queenie outside or something like that, you know, then, then you know, you got to use your common sense. I'd like to make a motion to direct the city manager to draft an uh, ordinance for animal control that would enhance uh, the existing ordinance as uh, we discussed today and then provide it for us for further review and, and discussion. I'll second. 
Amen. Any further discussion? Just to clarify, is that a discussion item then, or a and that is to prepare and draft an ordinance? Okay. To have it for first reading next time. Well, it doesn't have to be next time, but uh, <coughs> after Jim up. reviews and, and provides us with, and then we can make a discussion as to what we want included in the ordinance. We, we can discuss what, what's in it for before we vote on it, right? Correct. Yeah, that's the goal. I can prepare something based on the discussion and circulate it, and then you all can decide how you want to decide. Thank you all. All, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Black sign. Discussion on fiscal notes. First of all, I want to say before you get started, I like on our, our page today where it says fiscal notes. I think that's awesome. I'd like to see that on this exactly like that. Well, that's why we chose it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree we adopt this. Yeah, like much. Well, what we have. Hang on. <laughs> what, what we need to do. And uh, again, this this is something that uh, was brought up uh, in some of our emails, and I went ahead and took the liberty of drafting a proposed ordinance and circulated to you all to see if we had any feedback. <coughs> that, that's just sort of what I did was take uh, uh, the suggestions that you all had. Chicago recently adopted an ordinance, looked at it, sort of tried to put the two together and came up with something. Uh, if you all like it the way it is, we can just bring it at, back as is. If you have any like we did before any discussion or comments that I think we need to do this with it or do that with it additionally. I thought everything there was fine. I can't remember, um, because then we were discussing the Reddit. Um, you don't remember everything else, right? I've since then, I'm sorry. The only thing I don't want to see us get ourselves sort of locked into in terms of a fiscal note ordinance is we can't act without one. I mean, if that's not in there, is it? Well, actually it is. I, I, I had the same thought and I put the vision in there that said, Notwithstanding other provision of this ordinance, which is the parts that say you got to do it, a measure may be considered and adopted in the absence of a fiscal note of an emergency requiring waiver. The fiscal note requirement is declared by voting two thirds of board members. Okay. Well, I don't want to because these are our times when that happens. Into a situation where you know, and it happens to us all the time. Somebody comes in and, and wants us to waive a fee or whatever, and we say, "Oh, we can't do anything because we don't have the fiscal note attached to this." Right. So I, I just didn't want to get ourselves into that situation. I think anybody okay. needed. And just to clarify to the public, the fiscal note request basically enables you as the taxpayer to see what the, the cost of anything that's brought before the board uh, it is. And sometimes we have that information in our documentation, but it's not necessarily shared on the agenda or with the public uh, unless you get a FOI Freedom of Information Act. And this gives the, the taxpayer the opportunity to see the cost of anything that we are considering, and it's going to be available on the agenda. I like it. Who you drug you? Have you been you've been involved in this? Yes, sir. Okay, and beat your yes, financial sir. prowess. Yes, sir. <laughs> We're doing the right thing. Yes, sir. Okay. So I need to know. So bring it back for first reading in its current form. If nobody has any proposed changes, I uh, uh, mean, uh, yes, that'd be great. As you can see, the the finance department went ahead and. Gave you an example on the new. Do uh, I have a different agenda than everyone else? You might have. We got one especially for you. I got it from down there. Mine doesn't. Mine, just so you know, I'm not crazy. My printed agenda doesn't have that fiscal note. It's on. It's on my. It's on the tablet. Tablet, but it's not on the, my printed one. So I just was. That's why I said I'd like to see it on this, and everybody's like, I didn't demand it there. <laughs> we're, we're still working out the budget. We get those onto the agenda for everybody. So we don't need to do a motion. We're just going to draw. We'll bring back the first reading if the board is already drafted. So that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, appointment. Council. Oh, all right. Uh, mayor recommends appointment of Amanda Clark, City Commissioner, to the Ashland Housing Authority Board, and uh, we would need a motion to uh, approve on consent. Of the commission. <coughs> so moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, the mayor can serve in that. I have served in that before for an uh, appointed commissioner, and Commissioner Clark's first one I saw. It's my lucky day. It's a great board to, to serve on, and uh, she'll do a good job for us. All in favor? Aye. Uh, the mayor recommends appointment of David Daniel to the Ashland Planning Commission, and we could entertain a motion to approve and consent to the mayor's appointment. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, like signs. And the mayor recommends appointment of Mike Miller and Susan Fleming to the Ashland Board of Zoning and Adjustment. 
Can we entertain, can entertain a motion for approval and consent to the mayor's recommendation? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Any other new business? Uh, a motion to go in second session for individual personnel matters. Two. 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 I'm sorry. Two. Uh, we're going second session. It's, it's, we just go into a conference room here and usually, or only by law, we can talk about personnel, individual personnel, uh, litigation. If we're about to get sued or we're going to sue somebody, or property acquisition, something contractual. Am I right, guys? I'm covering very well. Okay. Uh, that's all we can talk about. One of those three things, and we're telling you, we're talking about a couple of personnel items, and we cannot take any action in executive session. So we're not going to go vote in there on anything. We're just going to talk about. It. We may come out here and vote. Uh, as a result, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we come out. We just adjourn. So it's not like we're secretive, but obviously with personnel, if, we, if we're going or not to take one way or the other some kind of action, we're not going to put anybody's name out there. We're not even sure what we're doing yet. So saying that, Mr. Williams, again, I want to thank you for the students for being here. Uh, <coughs> some of you got a few Z's in, I noticed. <laughs> I was due to lunch. I understand all that. I've been there. Uh, but by, basically, you you were uh, acting. Some of you acting like you're paying attention, but that made you feel good. But thanks for bringing them. And you, all, I would wait if I were you also, mm -hmm. so I could get back to mm -hmm. leadership. Catch, catch fifth period or sixth period, whatever it is now. Last period. Of time. Thank you all for being here.